Good afternoon, or good evening, Charleston Church of God. It's time for our Wednesday night Bible study. Before we start our study tonight, I have a list of people that have asked for prayer requests. Let's keep David and Carol Hargett in our prayers, Louise and Claude Hargett, Shirley Hargett, also Mildred Rowe and Robert Rowe. Mildred and Robert's grandson, Dustin Rowe, has had surgery on his knees and he needs our, our prayers as he's recuperating. Also remember Teresa Criswell, who had a knee replacement surgery. We have friends from New Albany, Benny and Melody Kirk. They visited a couple of times at church here in Charleston with us. Melody had both knees operated on and she is recuperating, but she needs our prayers. She's getting along well, but you know, God is able to heal and, and do so quickly. Uh, we need to keep Martha Morgan in prayer. She's at home doing well, recovering from a small illness and she's being safe, but we need to keep her in prayer. Sister Yvonne James and uh, just several, everybody in our church needs our prayers because we need to stay together in unity in these unprecedented times that we live in. We need to take care and love one another and always pray for one another with, with a pure heart. Also our country, our president, the politicians, our country's in a mess, church. And the only thing is if God's people will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, and seek him with all their heart, all their spirit, all their soul, God can make a difference in not only our lives, but our nation. So let's pray tonight. God, we come before the throne of grace through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, our high priest. We lift up all the needs, God, for we know that it is in you that we are healed. By Jesus' stripes, we were healed. And all provisions comes forth from the windows of heaven. God, thank you for your love, for your kindness, for salvation that is in your beloved son, Jesus Christ, who is the only way, the only truth, and the only life in this world. God, we thank you that we're coming back to church, that you're giving us new direction, Lord, a new vision, a new purpose to bring this world under the understanding of the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ through the good news of the gospel. Lord, help us tonight, Lord, to receive your word with meekness. Lord, let it change us, mold us, and shape us into the image of Christ. God, let your word have its way in us tonight, Father. Lord, for your word is truth and your word is life. God, I pray that you would anoint me to speak clearly the word of God that enables faith in us to come alive, that enables your works that were done on the cross and through Jesus Christ to come alive in us, Jesus in us, the only hope of glory. God, be glorified in us tonight. As we hear your word, let the Holy Spirit give it to our hearts plainly and simply to build us up and strengthen us. These things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. God is so good to us, church. And uh, I want us to get into his presence right now. You know, it's, it's one thing. God is omnipresent. He's all powerful. He's everywhere. But when he manifests his presence in our lives, when it becomes real to us, then and only then can we continue in maturity in the body of Christ. Our study tonight is entitled Deliverance from Sin. We're going to be reading from Romans 6, if you would like to get your Bibles and follow along. And Romans 6 lays out the foundation for the born-again Christian's deliverance from sin. God provides this deliverance for every believer so that all may enter into his rest and cease from sin. I want to be clear on an often discussed topic about when one is set free from sin. I want us to discuss this tonight in a little intricate detail that sometimes we leave out. You know, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, but so many times men change the gospel or give a watered down version of what Christ truly did in our lives, for us and through us, in us. Point one tonight, born again equals set free. Liberation from the power of sin may be experienced in the very hour a sinner accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and is born again. 
You do not have to be a long time believer and undergo numerous defeats because you can receive this gospel in an instance. You see, so many people believe that you have to work out all these things in your life before you believe. No, you don't have to work out anything. Christ finished work did this for you and for me. Christ, God himself and the Holy Spirit does the work. We merely must be willing to receive what has been done for us. Now, while salvation is a process, the Holy Spirit is able to equip you with a power to crucify the flesh and live according to the power of Jesus Christ that works in you to do God's will. A delay in accepting the full freedom of the gospel, according to Romans 6, is either due to the incomplete gospel being preached in today's world, as it so often is, or an unwillingness in wholly accepting and fully yielding to it. The blessings of walking in freedom from our old sins should be a common possession of all newly born Christians. Romans 6, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 8. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for he who has died to sin has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Praise the Lord. This is essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the knowledge that it takes to break free from the entangled snare of sin. Chapter 6 begins with a call to reminisce or take a look back at what had been not to anticipate. It directs our attention to the past, to what is already ours, knowing this, that our old man has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be annulled, that we should no longer serve sin. With this single verse, we find three major elements at work. Number one, sin. Notice it is the singular in number that it mentions sin itself. Number two, the old man. And number three, the body. This body we live in, the body of sin. <clears throat> These are three vastly different in nature and play unique roles in the act of sinning. Sin here is that which is commonly called the root of sin. The Bible states that we were formerly the slaves of sin. Sin had been our master. First of all, we need to recognize that sin possesses power, for it ensnares us, it enslaves us. It emits this power to draw us toward and into the obedience to its old man so that we might sin. The old man represents the total of everything we inherited from Adam. The, the old man is the natural man the sinful man. We can recognize the old man by knowing what is the new man. Because whatever is not of the new man must out of necessity belong to the old man. Our new man embraces everything that flows newly from the Lord at our regeneration or at our new birth. Therefore, the old man shows an indication of everything in our personality which exists outside the new man our old personality, and all which belongs to that old nature. We can simply put, because this old man loves sin, and it's under its power. Now, the body of sin refers to this body that we live in. The fleshly part of man has become the puppet in all our sinning. 
It is labeled the body of sin because it is subject to the power of sin and is fully filled with the lust and the desires of sin. And it is through our natural body that sin manages to express itself and becomes a visible power in our lives. To summarize, sin is the power which pulls or tempts us to disobey God and do the acts of the ungodly flesh. The nature of the old man is part of what we inherited from Adam. The body of sin is the other half of what we inherit, this natural sinful flesh. There is an order in the process of sinning. First, sin. Next, the old man. And lastly, the body. Sin exudes its power to attract the old man and force him to sin. Since the old man delights in sin itself, he condones sins and bends to it, instigating the body to commit to sin's pull. The body serves the old man and the enemy's promptings as a puppet, and it actually practices sin, the body does. It practices what the old man desires in his heart. And the body desires this because it is the desire of the flesh. The flesh is a nemnity against God. It cannot please God. So the, the body and the old man pulls us away from the calling and the spirit of God. It is through the joint functions of these three elements that sin is committed. The compulsion of sin's power is always present with us. That is the inclinations of the old man and the practice of the body. Now, how can a man be delivered from sin? Some people believe that sin is the first cause that we must destroy to attain victory. So they advocate the ratification of sin. How do you eradicate something that has been planted? You pull it up by the roots. And they, by seemingly doing this, they think that sin is defeated and we are sanctified. Others argue that we must subdue our body if we desire to overcome sin. They argue that it is our body that practices sin. These beliefs alone produce a severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence. They, they use many techniques to, the, to suppress their desires to fall short of sin or to fail in their attempt to sin. They anticipate that once they have overcome the demand sin place on their lives and bodies that they shall be holy. Church, these are lies from the enemy. He wants us to mix religion with the relationship and the things that God has already done and finished in us so that we become part of the equation. Listen, church, our salvation is from God. We have no part in it. All our self-righteousness is as a filthy rag unto God and nothing the flesh can do or stop doing can please God aside from him and his Holy Spirit and Christ who works in us the hope of glory. Now, there's no difference in this than trying to keep the law of God in our own power. You see, that's what happened in the first church. Paul had to warn some of the Christians, you began in the spirit and now you're trying to walk through it in the flesh. You try to keep laws and regulations to make yourself holy, and this cannot be done. Holiness only comes through the righteousness of God that is in Christ Jesus. We can't manufacture it, church. You can't make yourself good because there is no good in us. So it's impossible, utterly impossible, to stop sinning aside from the finished work of the cross. None of this is God's way. Let's look at Romans 6, 6. It says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer would be enslaved to sin. You know, God neither eradicates the root of sin within or suppresses the body without, but rather he deals with the old man in between. Point two of our study, God's fact in going to the cross, the Lord Jesus took with him not only our sins, but also our beings. Paul describes this fact by saying that poor old man has been crucified with him, that is with Jesus Christ. 
The verb crucified in the original is the simple or undefined tense. It suggests that our old man was once and forever crucified with him. Just as the cross of Christ is an accomplished fact, so is our being crucified with him. Somebody needs to praise the Lord about right now because it's not something we did. It's a process. When Jesus says it is finished, that is what he meant. All sin and debt was paid for. The innocent for the guilty. Everything was put away and we all died in him that when he arose on that glorious morn, we all took part in that resurrection as a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old man was dead and the new man was alive in Christ. Praise him, church, because he is worthy to be praised. Somebody needs to, to realize tonight that freedom from sin is not accomplished in the flesh. It's accomplished in the spirit, believing God's word to be true. God's word, they are spirit and they are life. You know, I heard someone say this afternoon that the Bible was a religious book. No, there's many religious books in this world. The Bible is the inspired word of God. And inside that word, there is life. Inside that word, there is power. Inside that word, there is freedom. The truth will set you free, church, but you have to receive it by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. You can't receive it with a head knowledge. You have to let the Holy Spirit operate on your heart and begin to write on the table of your heart the inspired word of God that is able to change us and make us new creations in the image of Jesus Christ. Now, whoever questions the reality of the crucifixion of Christ, you know, no scientist no religious expert of today, no educated person can contradict the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Now, why then should we question or doubt the reality of the crucifixion of our old man? Many saints, upon hearing the truth of our co-death with Christ, immediately assume that they ought to die. Excuse me. So they try their best to crucify themselves. It is either a lack of God's revelation or a lack of faith that accounts for this attitude. They not only do this themselves, but they teach others to do this as well. The results are too obvious. They have no power to be freed from sin and their old man they feel will not die. This is a grievous misjudgment in the body of Christ. The Bible never anywhere instructs us to crucify ourselves. We are told precisely the opposite. We are instead taught that when Jesus went to Calvary, he took us there and had us crucified with him. We are not instructed to begin crucifying ourselves anew. Instead, the scripture assures us that our old man was dealt with at the time Christ went to the cross. Romans 6, 6 alone is, is, is uh, sufficient to substantiate this fact. There is not a remote idea in this passage that points us towards self-crucifixion, nor is there an implication that our crucifixion awaits a realization. This verse permits no room for doubt when it pronounces that we were crucified with Christ, a fact already accomplished. When we err is when we try to place ourselves into salvation, as if we could do anything to complete the process that our understanding, our thoughts, or our accomplishments could do. Salvation, I said before, belongs to God and is strictly instituted by him and him alone. In my opinion, the most effective and precious phrase in the Bible is in Christ. It is because we are in him and we are united with him that we can say that when Christ went to the cross, we went there with him. That when Christ was crucified, we too were crucified with him. What a wonderful and powerful reality that we are crucified with Christ. You know, I quote it so often. I know people say, well, that's the only scripture he knows, but it's not church. But the important scripture, the important thing that we need to understand in living in today's world is Galatians 
I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Church, this is the gospel in a nutshell. We're crucified with him so that we may live with him. We're, we die with him so that we're born again into the resurrection of Christ. Mere accommodations of these truths, it cannot withstand temptations. The revelation of God is positively essential in our shedding of sin and the old man's desire to live. The Spirit of God must reveal in our hearts how we are in Christ and how we are united with him as one. He must also allow us to see and come to the full understanding that our old man was crucified with Christ for the simple reason that we are in Christ. This cannot simply be a mental comprehension. It must also be admitted to us through the disclosure of the Holy Spirit. What a, when a truth is rightly unfolded by God, it is most naturally a power in man. It becomes a power in us who then finds himself able to believe and to receive that faith comes through revelation, and without this comprehension, it is impossible to believe and receive. This explains why so many do not have faith in these last days. Although they mentally understand, they do not have God's revelation and understanding, which is spiritual. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, we must pray until God gives us revelation so that knowing this in our spirits, we may truly confess that our old man has been crucified with him. What is the consequence of the crucifixion of our old man? Again, the answer comes to us unequivocally that the body of sin might be annulled. Annulled must be understood as rendered, withered, or unemployed. Before this, when sin still stirred in us, our old man responded and the body practiced sin. With the crucifixion of the old man and its replacement by the newborn again man, sin may still stir an attempt to exert its providence, but it fails to find the consent of the old man to drive the body to sin. Sin no longer tempts the believer because he is a new man. The old has died. The work of the old flesh was sin, but the new man has caused the sin of the body to be unemployed, giving us the victory over it. When our spirit and our new man is tuned into the Holy Spirit, our body is unable to sin and has been denied of its sinful nature. Praise the Lord. This is what was finished and furnished to us by the work of the cross. Why does God crucify our old man with Christ and render our bodies jobless? His purpose is that we should no longer serve sin. We now serve God in his righteousness in order to glorify him. What God has done in this regard makes it possible for us not to yield to the pressure of sin, nor to be bound up in its power. Sin will no longer exercise dominion over us. Hallelujah, church. We, 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 we praise God for this deliverance because this is the only way we can worship him in spirit and in truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Praise God. Point three in my last point the two essentials of entering the blessing. How do we enter into such a blessing? There are two elements that are indispensable. Romans 6, 11 through 14. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. This is essential to faith, church. When God vows that our old man was crucified with Christ, we believe his word and reckon ourselves as dead. How do we die? We reckon ourselves to be dead to sin. When God affirms that we are resurrected with Christ, we again trust his word and reckon ourselves alive. 
How then do we live, church? We reckon ourselves as alive unto God. This reckoning is nothing more than believing God according to his word. When God says our old man was crucified, we account ourselves dead. When he insists that we are made alive in Christ Jesus, we reckon ourselves as alive. The failure of many Christians to do so lies in their desire to feel, in their emotions, to see and experience this crucifixion and resurrection before trusting the word of God. Of God. They do not realize God has already done in Christ Jesus the thing that he has done at the cross, and that if only we would obey his word by reckoning that, we, that what he has done is true, the Holy Spirit would then give us the experience. His Spirit would communicate to them what is in Christ. Second, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves to God as alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. This is essential to conse consecration. If we continue in holding on to something which God wants us to relinquish, sin will have dominion over us, and our reckoning will be futile. If we fail to yield our bodies as godly instruments of righteousness to speak and to do what he desires and go where he directs, then we shouldn't be surprised when we are not yet delivered from sin. Let God's word have its way in your heart and your will will be changed and you will be free from the bondage of sin. Church, stop trying not to commit sin and start believing God has already worked this out when we were born again in the image of Jesus Christ and it's by his power and his life of resurrection that we will be resurrected from the old body of sin and death into the new body of life in Christ Jesus. This is our only hope in this world that the light will begin to shine in us. You see, there is light comes from us every day. That light, if we do not reckon God's word to be true, if we do not receive the revelation of the Holy Spirit and what God has done for us on the cross of Christ, then we will walk in the old man and our light will be darkness. But if we begin to believe that we are reckoned unto death in Christ Jesus, we're also reckoned unto life through his resurrection, then the light of Christ will begin to shine from our lives and the world will see who is King of kings and Lord of lords. The world will see where salvation comes from. The world will see the only way to get back to the Father is through the Son. Jesus Christ, who is the finished work for us. He left it on the cross. And when he rose from the dead by the glory of God, he gave us new life. Receive that new life. If there's anyone out there that don't know Christ tonight, today is the day of salvation. Understand that your sins were nailed to the cross, that you are forgiven completely through the shedding of Jesus' blood, and by his stripes you are healed from every sin and disease that this world and the devil has placed upon you. And also know that through the new man you're being created in the image of Jesus Christ, that you will begin to shine and you will begin to be used by God. Accept him, repent, turn from your old ways, and let God bring new life to you. Let us pray. God, we thank you. God, that you finished everything on the cross in Christ Jesus, that there's nothing we can do to attain salvation or to stop from the sin that is in our lives. We only must reckon that you have finished the work in us and that you have given, the power, given us power through resurrection to be born again in the power of God. Lord, help us to walk in newness of life. Lord, create in us a clean heart and a right spirit. Lord, give us a steadfast spirit and let your will be done in heaven and earth as it is in heaven. God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you receive tonight from the word. I hope it builds and strengthens you to walk in the freedom that we have been given. I look forward to seeing you Sunday, those that's coming and gathering at church and those who watch online on Facebook and YouTube. Be blessed the rest of this week and may God watch over you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>